so I'm really happy to just kick things off with six minutes of comments here. The first is that uh, I am also an associate director of High, and, and in addition to Kurt, with whom I work closely, I just want to tell you that High, you're in the High space right now, human-centered AI. It's an institute at Stanford. It's devoted to the idea that there are at least three pillars of AI that we need to worry about. We need to worry about the human impacts of AI. That's kind of the H. We want to augment humans in their pursuits. We don't really want to replace them. Replacement might happen in some cases, but the overall goal is to augment the human experience, augment human productivity, and augment the humanism, which was the first pillar. And then the third is we want to really build tools that are intelligent and useful uh, and maybe even modeled on some of the capabilities of the human brain. Um, for example, we, AI is amazing at identifying cats, but it took a few million pictures of cats. My five-year-old grandson saw one cat, watched it for 10 minutes, and knows cats now uh, for the rest of his life. So never have those three pillars uh, been so stressed out as they are by the release of ChatGPT4 and, and similar tools over the last few months. You all know, I suspect, the rate of uptake of these tools in all aspects of life has gone uh, exponential. I think 100 million people signed up for ChatGPT in some very short period of time. And it's causing many of us to think about existential questions about our personal life, our professional life, and everything in between, if there, if there is such a thing. So, so, this, so I want to thank Kurt and Amy. And, and Kurt will tell you a little bit more about Amy, I suspect. But Amy and I work closely together in this incredibly fertile area of AI in healthcare, uh, and, and also increasingly in biomedical research and discovery all of which is challenged in both exciting and worrisome ways by ChatGPT. I wanted to finish just with a story about my first experience uh, towards the, the theme of this meeting. Uh, Eric Horvitz and his colleagues invited a, a bunch of healthcare workers uh, like me uh, and from Stanford and other places, but it was a small group, to get an early look at ChatGPT4 about three weeks or a month before it was released. And I just want to tell you, and I suspect many of you have had this experience, so I'm just validating, I think, the experience that you likely had. We came in with some clinical cases. Some of them were hard, some of them weren't easy, but we had a hard one, a 63-year-old with shortness of breath, and then we had the history of the present illness, and we typed in uh, or pasted it in, and then about halfway through the case, we said, like, what are you thinking now as potential diagnoses? And in kind of a stunning uh, display, we got two pages, not only of an incredibly re reasonable differential diagnosis, but without saying it, it was pretty much presented in the order of likelihood. It never said this is in the order of likelihood, but we all looked at it and said, wow, this is in the order of likelihood. Then we gave it some more facts and it refined and it came up with a very good, very good list. Um, I'll tell you about the negatives in a second. I'm going to make this a positive story to start out with. So at the end, it had this differential. It was great. It said, really, it's probably this. It could be this. It could be this. Then we said, what happens if this patient is not from Palo Alto, but is from Ghana? And it said, oh, and then it changed the differential. That was my first, let's say, holy cow moment. I know this is being, it wasn't actually a cow. It was something else. But it was a holy cow moment to say, oh, Ghana, different differential. Um, then we said, uh, and this was like a little bit of help and nudging from Eric and his colleagues, but also us kind of saying, let's try this. Uh, somebody said, what would you tell a normal 60-year-old about their disease? We asked it. And it gave a beautiful summary of the disease in one paragraph in lay terms that was perfectly transmittable to the patient on the site. Then we said, what would you tell the man's five-year-old grandson about his grandfather's disease? And it came up with a four-sentence, five-year-old level, perfectly good summary. And then in the final holy cow moment, we said, what happens if we're back in Ghana and those paragraphs have to be in Swahili? And it gave it to us in Swahili. Now, I did not read the Swahili. I don't know how good the Swahili was, but it looked good to me. <laughs> um, and, and we all, we went out to dinner and many of us needed that dinner because it was so kind of troubling slash exciting. And I, I checked in with many of those folks afterwards, and many of us lost sleep that evening 
thinking about what this meant. And I suspect uh, that many of you have had similar experiences, maybe by doing almost parallel things. So that's why I want to thank Kurt and, 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 and my colleagues at High and Amy for putting this together, because this helps us all start to process what this means for the future, what this means for medical education. The final thing I'll say is, Right now, it is unbelievably good at brainstorming, and I accept it right now for my clinical duties as a brainstorming partner. I would not let it treat patients. I think we're going to talk about this today. And the model I have is the very slick-talking third-year medical student who sounds like a million bucks, but you know is probably full of BS, and, but you don't know where. And that's where I am right now with ChatGPT4. Um, let me throw it back to Kurt. Thanks, and enjoy the meeting. Thank you, Russ. And maybe you should have asked it to translate the Swahili back into English, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. you could have checked it all out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so a little bit about Amy. So Amy uh, does much to coordinate the AI and health activities here at Stanford and works closely with HI, as, as Russ said. We have about 150 faculty across 20 departments, mostly in the schools of engineering and medicine, all of whom are interested in near to midterm uh, application of AI to health type problems. And so we do a lot to support them with uh, grants and making data available and uh, many other things. Um, so we are delighted to support this event as well and work closely with HI uh, on many similar activities as Russ mentioned. I wanted to be uh, a little more concrete about strengths and weaknesses of chat GPT after I had my uh, oh crap moment, uh, whatever we would wanna call it. Um, obviously, amazing strengths. So we know, thanks to uh, Eric's work with a number of his colleagues, that it passes many board exams, medical licensing exams. Uh, it has obvious applications in medicine and health, as we've heard, uh, differential diagnosis, communication with patients, communication with families, even possibly sending emails to patients, sending letters to insurance companies. Um, the possibilities are, are far and wide. And there are even some early published results looking at how uh, it can help us understand guidelines in a way that we might not have understood them, um, these kinds of published guidelines. But there are problems. Um, the computer scientists and the medical folks disagree on whether you should call it confabulation or hallucination. Uh, I favor confabulation, but you know, to each his own. So there's some of that that there's just, it makes stuff up sometimes. Um, there are issues of doing even sometimes simple math. Uh, there was a nice article recently about issues of planning, uh, even simple planning tasks. It sometimes has difficulty as sort of a feed forward system, handling those kinds of things. And then back when I trained in AI in the 1980s, we were thinking a lot about logic, and Bayesian reasoning is kind of an optimal way to do differential diagnosis. So we all, I think, have to consider what are the priors that ChatGPT and these large language models are using? It's really based on whatever, the, whatever corpus of text they were trained on. So if there are certain diseases that maybe got more of a mention because of someone famous who had that disease or for whatever reason, that may um, skew its thinking in certain ways that might make it more like that medical student that Russ is talking about rather than the, the optimal uh, clinician. I also just want to make the point that, uh, and this is a bit of a parochial point, I think Stanford is the ideal place for us to be thinking about these issues. Uh, Stanford has amazing, with all due respect to our non-Stanford speakers today, <laughs> Stanford has got, uh, as Russ said, you know, scientific discovery strengths. Uh, and in the Amy Center, uh, strengths related to building computer decision support applications for physicians. You'll hear in a moment from Nigam Shah, who's the chief data scientist at our hospital, which is just a short walk down the sidewalk, uh, where we can experiment with care delivery and how these algorithms can influence the care of our patients and furthermore supply uh, training data and other information that we can use to, to help build these systems. And then lastly, of course, being here in Silicon Valley, so that if we do build something that can benefit patients, we can rapidly scale it uh, across the country, across the world. So there's a lot of work going on here at Stanford, um, work on using these models to communicate with patients, do differential diagnosis, and a whole variety of other things that, that we'll uh, touch on today. So with that, uh, I will again welcome you here and introduce Nigam Shah, who's going to give us a brief primer on uh, large language models.